In this lesson, we're going to learn how physics can help explain the behavior of electric charges. So by the end of this lesson, there's three things I want you to take away from this lesson. So I want you to be able to explain electrical interactions in terms of the law of conservation of charge. You uh, must be able to explain electrical interactions in terms of repulsion and attraction of charges. And third, you must be able to compare the methods of transferring a charge, whether it be through conduction and induction. So you're going to have to compare and contrast conduction and induction and how they transfer charges. So electricity is all around us. And it's our understanding of electrical principles that has helped us make our lives better. For instance, you might not even know a lot of times you're using technology that uses electricity. For instance, contact lenses. They use electrostatic attraction to hold your contact lenses to your eyes. And everything else in our world pretty much runs on electricity. How I'm making this video for you right now and how you guys are able to watch it is all based on electricity. It's very hard to think today how life would be like without electricity. Now the first person who discovered or that we have recorded for discovering electricity came from an ancient Greek philosopher named Thales who by rubbing amber together and rub he was able to get it to attract to straw. This is where we get the word electricity from, which comes from the word electron, which actually means amber. But now, let's take a look at our first concept covered in this unit, and that is going to be the law of electrostatics. So, what is that? Well, we're talking about the laws of electric charge, and that states that there's only two kinds of charges. There's a positive charge and a negative charge. Now, from this, we know that like charges repel and unlike charges attract. You may have experimented with this as a kid when you're rubbing your a balloon, a rubber balloon, against your hair and you notice something. If you had two rubber balloons and you rub them against your hair, the two balloons will repel each other. But they're both attracted to your hair or your hair is attracted to the balloon as you move them closer to your hair, your hair will try and touch the balloon. That has to deal with charges, a positive and negative charge. We're going to learn how that happens later. So basically this is what we have to think of. Positively charged possesses more protons than electrons. So anything that is positively charged possesses more protons than electrons. Anything that is negatively charged possesses more electrons than protons. And an uncharged thing has an equal number of protons and electrons. So here is something for you to try at home. If you have an M. Night rod or just a comb, I want you to rub it in a piece of fur and if you don't have fur you could try in your hair just make sure your hair is dry and then bring it to water and I want you to see what happens just pour a little stream of water don't touch the water just bring it to a thin stream of water from the tap and see as you bring it close to the water how it interacts then do the same thing with a piece of glass with either fur or use your hair just careful not to cut yourself or your hair and Bring that towards the water and I want you to see how they react and then think about our laws and see if you could come up with some interesting theories. So pause the video and try that out. Welcome back. So let's delve deeper into this world of static electricity where opposites attract and likes repel. So what that, that means is a positive and a negative are opposite charges they are going to attract. We also know then that a negative and a negative will repel. That also tells us that a positive and positive will repel. Now, how do these repel? And by what forces do they repel with? Well, that comes back to physics 20 and Newton's third law. So if I look at this, the force for these two positive charges of B upon A is going to be in the exact opposite direction of the force of A upon B. So for every action or force, there's an opposite and equal reaction or force. And that works perfectly well for these repelling charges. It's Newton's third law. And they'll repel with the same amount of force. Now, let's look at attracting charges. We have them going in the opposite direction. So the force of D upon C is going to the right. And the force of C upon D is going to the left. And once again, they are opposite but equal reactions. For every reaction, there is an opposite and equal reaction which is Newton's third law. So these electric forces also must follow Newton's laws. So now you might be questioning, hey, wait, 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 what about things without a charge? So if I have an object that's charged, how does it interact with something that's not charged? Well, let's think about that. 
If it's a charged object and a not charged object, they obviously do not have like charges. Therefore, they will attract. So then now, if we think about this, we just added a little bit more rules to our situation here. So for things to repel, we need to have two objects that are charged with like charges. But for things to attract, we really only need one object charged. If we have two charged objects, they must be opposite or only one object is charged. So now let's see how well you understand this concept. I have two cases here. I have case one and I have case two down here. In case one, we have A and B attract and C and B repel. I want you, based on what we learned before, to see if you can figure out what is the charges on A and C given that B is negative. And then I want you to do the same thing for case two, except in case two, A and B attract, and here we have A and C repel. And we know here that B is negative. So can you figure out the charges of A and C? So I want you to pause the video and see if you could solve that, and then we'll check your answers. Okay, let's see how well you did. Well, we look at A and B in case one. A is attracted to B and B is negative. Therefore, the charges must be opposites. So we know A must be either positive or it must be neutral. Now we look at C and B. C and B repel. Therefore they must be like charges and it cannot be neutral. Therefore we know C must be negative. Now let's look at case 2. For case 2, A and B, they attract. So once again we look at case 2, A is either positive or neutral. But, if I look at the second part of case 2, A repels C. Therefore, A and C must be light charges. They, A now is not neutral, so therefore, A must be positive. And we also know then that C is also positive. So, before we get farther into electricity, we must first understand the atom. So, it started off 400 years ago, when Greek philosophers decided to call it atomos, where everything could be broken down to its finest particle or pure substance, which would be its atomos. Later on, you have J.J. Thompson who discovered electrons in what he called the Raisinbud Mine. So these little electrons in a positive sphere. Eventually, Ernest Rutherford came along and said, no, this is positive is in the center and the electrons orbit around the center. To eventually, Niels Bohr came in and said, each electron is in quantized energy level. And then you still have that positive center in the middle, which is the nucleus, until we get, which we're going to learn later in this class, about the quantum theory of the atom. So basically this leads to an understanding that the center of the atom, or the nucleus, is where the protons are, and they are positive. And the negative electrons are what must move, since we can't move stuff from the proton. So that brings us up to some definitions we need to know on what is a charge. So the buildup of electrons, or the deficiency of electrons. Because we cannot move those protons which are in the nucleus. We can only move the electrons which are orbiting around our nucleus in an atom. So conductors are materials that allow electrons to flow at ease. So they allow those, ele those outer electrons to flow easily, whereas insulators are materials that do not allow the flow of electrons. So then from previous science classes, you probably have learned that conductors tend to be metals. They allow electrons to flow easily in their outer shells, whereas insulators, the nucleuses, which are positive charged protons, will bind the electrons closer and they tend to not allow your electrons to flow. That's why they will be insulators. So let's take a look here. How would electrons move? Now electrons are like charges. So if I distribute an electron to any metallic sphere, any conductor, which is normally a metal, what will end up happening is the electrons will then separate because they want to be as far away from each other as possible because they are like charges and like charges repel. And this part here is an insulator. So my like charges are going to be in my conductor and they're going to move as far away as each other as possible. This is really important when we start learning about how to transfer and move charges. So let's look at this diagram here to help us understand the importance of insulators and the importance of conductors. So these Coca-Cola cans are conductors, meaning the electrons will flow through them easily. Whereas these styrofoam cups are insulators, meaning 
electrons will not pass through them. So even if this Coca-Cola can has a charge, these charges and an abundance of negative charges, that means it has an abundance of electrons, then the only way it could discharge electrons is by touching the other Coca-Cola can. The electrons will not pass through the insulator. It is also important to note that if the Coca-Cola can here is lacking charges, then the only way it could get electrons would be from these cola cans. So if these were neutral, it would steal some electrons from those if we drove this Coca-Cola can closer and touched it. Because the only way we can move electrons is through the cola cans and not through the insulator cups. So that's something to remember. Some materials are good conductors while some are good insulators. So we have one other type of material which is called a semiconductor. Now semiconductors are very interesting. In certain situations, under certain conditions, they will be insulators while as under other conditions they will be good conductors. An example of this is selenium. So selenium is a conductor when light is shone on it, but in the dark it is an insulator. We use this idea for photocopying. So if I think about this here, I put a photocopy sheet down here where this A is. Now light is going to flash off this. So we know dark absorbs light. So where the dark is, it's going to absorb light and everything else is going to reflect. Where there was no dark writing, it's going to reflect. And it hits this mirror, hits another mirror, and then hits down into this selenium coated roll. And they make sure that selenium coated roll is given a positive charge. Now when the light hits the roll, the selenium drum will no longer be an insulator and become a conductor. Because light is what makes it a conductor and dark makes it an insulator. And that will allow this positive charge drum to gain electrons. And then the reaction of that with our negatively charged toner brush will allow us to print off where it was positively charged, the lighters, because remember the light didn't hit where the lighters were because it absorbs the light, will allow us to make a nice little photocopy of what we had before. And that's one of the amazing ways that we can use semiconductors in technology. So now we're going to look at some common ways to give things a charge. The first way we're going to look at is through friction. So we have all used friction to give charges before, especially when we were kids, to shock people. But have you ever wondered which one's getting the positive charge? Is it you or the carpet, or in which one's getting the negative charge. Well, a way to figure that out is through the tribal electric series, which is a chart like this here. So the top of the tribal electric series charts, we always have objects that like electrons where they hold electrons tightly. And the bottom hold electrons loosely and they don't like electrons. So basically, let's take a look at my first example. If I have a glass rod and it's rubbed, with silk, what happens to the glass rod? So I'm going to look at my glass rod and it's going to be rubbed with silk. And silk is above it. So that means the silk will take the electrons. So my glass rod will end up becoming positive because electrons go from the rod to the silk because electrons are always going to go up. Okay? Now let's look at my second one. An ebonite rod is rubbed with fur or wool. So here I have an ebonite rod being rubbed with fur or wool. So what's that going to give me? Well, the ebonite is above, so it is going to gain electrons, so the ebonite will be a negative charged object. So the main thing is to remember is the higher one on the table becomes negative and the lower one always becomes positive. Now here's a question for you to ponder. Why would ebonite get a more negative charge when you rub it with silk compared to fur? So why would the charge be more negative with ebonite? I want you to try and tell me this answer tomorrow.